Dr. And Dr. 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 Kumar. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. 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 Mr. Jambusari has joined or not yet? Or not joined? Uh, no, sir, not yet. Mr. Tola will be available, no? Sorry? President will be available, no? Tola, Mr. Tola? Uh, uh, but the uh, unfortunately, the president is pre preoccupied, so as um, I, I will be probably opening up, uh, followed by your delivery and the vice president's delivery. Okay. And then um, uh, I will... Uh, also do the honors of closing up, uh, okay. summing okay. our discussions. Um, right. So uh, he's regretted because um, uh, he is um, engaged in, um, in, um, uh, in um, the, uh, uh, the budget which was recently announced. Oh, so right. there are a lot of challenges. So he's part of the, he's chairing the anomaly committee and that meeting um, is, has been extended. So. Um, because of his uh, preoccupation in that area, unfortunately, um, he'll not be able to join us today. Uh, but um, I'm here replacing him. Um, and uh, also, I'll be uh, doing um, the closing. So, um, whenever you're ready, Rahil, um, with the permission of the president, I think we are close to start. Uh, so whenever you're ready, you, you, you can start the proceedings with the permission yeah, sure. of the president. Sure, sure, sir, sure. Uh, live okay for Facebook Live. Got it. Gotcha. So we can formally start now. Uh, a very warm welcome uh, to all the panelists and to the participants on the awareness session on anti-money laundering and countering financing of terrorism being organized by the South uh, AML Committee of the South Asian Federation of Accountants. Uh, it is with uh, great pleasure I want to uh, inform all of you that it is the first time uh, that an exclusive AML CFT webinar is being organized at the committee level of SAFA. And we are very much uh, thankful to the president of SAFA for gracing the occasion along with the other uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, without uh, wasting any time, I would like to request uh, Mr. Khalid Rahman, uh, the chairman of the SAFA AML committee and the council member of ICAP for his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahil. Um, good afternoon. Um, uh, I um, would like to welcome uh, President Safa, uh, Vice President Safa, 
probably will be joining us shortly and the panel mem members who have graciously given time for today's uh, session on uh, <clears throat> awareness on any money anti money laundering and counter financing as rahil has mentioned that this is the first um, initiative of the aml committee of safa and uh, there'll be many initiatives uh, um, going forward as we all know the significance of the any anti money laundering and counter counter financing of terrorism um, it is a very important area. Um, we have experienced uh, a lot of challenges on this in Pakistan and have learned a lot in, the, in that process. Um, the technology is obviously is always a challenge and uh, other related mechanisms. And uh, therefore, uh, the compliance, uh, AML compliance has increased uh, to some degree, but uh, there's a lot of uh, more effort uh, that has to be done and uh, sort of imparting uh, knowledge and information and, and uh, practices in this area are highly important. Now, on behalf of the AML Committee of SAFA, um, I would like to mention that the committee will continue to hold awareness sessions for member bodies in future. Uh, as I said earlier, to impart knowledge and awareness regarding the evolving compliance obligations for the designated non-financial businesses and professions and uh, paying particular focus uh, to accountants. In today's session, we have four eminent speakers who are actively involved in the compliance regime of AMLs to CFT in South Asia region. It is indeed a great opportunity for all of us to take guidance from these industry experts. We also have the privilege to have with us the Honorable President and Vice President of SAFA. Thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere thanks to the organizers, especially uh, you, Rahil, um, who have coordinated this, uh, this effort, um, the SAFA Secretariat, who have worked with you, um, greatly um, indebted to you, and then the entire uh, AML committee of SAFA and uh, the speakers who are with us uh, today. Uh, all of you have been working uh, with us since the beginning of the planning stage, and. Uh, uh, and you are still here with us today. Even though um, everybody is very busy, but uh, you, uh, we are giving time in, the, in public interest to make sure that um, uh, we are able to deliver uh, knowledge um, and practices uh, which, are important, which are extremely important in the area of uh, this um, anti-money laundering and counter-terror terror financing. So with that, um, uh, without any further ado, I would hand, hand over the, uh, uh, the floor to Rahil for, uh, the next, um, uh, uh, for the next session. Uh, thank you, Khalid Saab. Thank you very much. Uh, moving forward, I would now like to request uh, Honorable President, South Asian Federation of Accountants, Mr. Hanaike Bandara, to, play, to have his keynote speech. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you again uh, for your introduction. Uh, Mr. Nihar Jambusari, Vice President of SAPA, who will be joining with us uh, shortly. Mr. Rahman, Chairman, AML Committee of SAPA. Eminent speakers, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me thank the Chairman, members, and Secretary of the AML Committee for organizing this webinar within a very short period and inviting me to deliver the keynote speech about anti money laundering and countering financing of terrorism. I also would like to thank Mr. Yusuf Tola, President IC Pakistan, for the support extended to organize this awareness session for the benefit of the accounting fraternity in the South Asian region. It is a true pleasure for me to be here on behalf of SAFA, and I'm delighted to address you all on the subject matter, as I too have involved with regulators in implementing laws and regulations when I was the compliance officer, as well as the general manager CEO of the largest savings bank in Sri Lanka. All of you would agree that the subject as formulated is far too wide for fair coverage within the limited time allotted. I therefore will confine my remarks to provide 
the overall view of the subject area. First, let us consider international effort in strengthening the AML CFT framework. In response to the growing concerns about money laundering and terrorist financing activities, the international community has acted on many fronts. The international effort began with the recognition that drug trafficking was an international issue and could only be addressed effectively on a multilateral basis. Thus, the first international convention concerning money laundering has had drug trafficking as the only predicate offense. However, with growing international concerns, most countries now include a wide range of offenses as mind laundering predicates offenses. Thereafter, several international organizations have taken many initiatives to strengthen the global AML CFT framework. The United Nations UN was the first international organization to undertake significant action to fight against money laundering on a worldwide basis. The role played by the UN is important as it has the ability to adopt international treaties or conventions that have the effect of a law in a country once that country has signed, ratified, and implemented the convention depending on the country's constitution and legal structure. Several conventions and resolutions adopted by the UN are of importance in combating money laundering and terrorist financing in the world. In response to mounting concern over money laundering, the Financial Action Task Force on Money Laundering, FATF, was established by the G7 summit held in Paris in 1989 recognizing the threat posed to the banking system and to financial institutions. The G7 heads of states and president of the European Commission convened the task force from G7 member states, the European Commission and eight other countries. The Financial Action Task Force is an intergovernment body whose purpose is the development and promotion of policies, both at national and international levels, to combat money laundering and terrorist financing. The task force is therefore a policy-making body which works to generate the necessary political will to bring about national legislative and regulatory reforms in these areas. In 1990, the FATF issued a report containing a set of 40 recommendations, which provides a comprehensive plan of action needed to fight against mind laundering. In 2001, the development of standards in the fight against terrorist financing was added to the mission of the FATF. In October 2001, the FATF issued eight special recommendations to deal with the issue of terrorist financing. The continued evolution of money laundering techniques led the FATF to revise the FATF standards comprehensively in 2003. In 2004, the FATF published a ninth special recommendation further strengthening the agreed international standards for countering the financing of terrorism. The, these 40 plus nine recommendations set out international standards for anti money laundering measures and combating the financing of terrorism and terrorist acts. They also set out the principles for action and allow countries a measure of, of flexibility in implementing these principles according to their particular circumstances and 
constitutional framework. FATF recommendations are therefore intended to be implemented at the national level through, the, through legislation and, and other legally binding measures. The standards were revised from time to time concerning the new development. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to unprecedented global challenges, human suffering and economic disruption. Criminals have been quick to seek ways to exploit this crisis, despite the exceptional circumstances. The FATF has continued advancing its important work. It has highlighted COVID-19 related threats and vulnerabilities, as well as policy responses to address them. In the case of virtual assets, FATF has issued global binding standards to prevent the misuse of virtual assets for money laundering and terrorist financing. The standards ensure that virtual assets are treated fairly, applying the same safeguards as the financial sector. Apart from that, the base Basel Committee on Banking Supervision has formulated three supervisory standards and guidelines concerning money laundering issue. One, the statement of principles of money laundering outlined the basic policies and procedures that bank management should ensure that are in place within their institution to assist in suppression money laundering through the banking system. Two, the core principles for banking, which provides a comprehensive blueprint for an effective bank supervisory system covering wide topics, including KYC and customer due diligence policies. Three, extensive paper on KYC principles. Other than such institutions, International Association of Insurance Supervisors and International Organization of Securities Commissioners have also contributed to the global effort in converting money laundering and terrorist financing. More importantly, establishment of regional monitoring bodies play a crucial role in the fight against money laundering and terrorism financing through monitoring implementation and enforcement of FATF, FATF recommendation. They also administer mutual evaluation of their members, which are intended to identify weaknesses so that members may take remedial action. They also provide information to their members about trends, techniques, and other developments in the field of money laundering and terrorist financing. Regional bodies are voluntary and cooperative organizations which are being organized based on geographical region. Currently, the FATF has recognized several regional bodies. Let me now talk about the position of Sri Lanka, in other words, about uh, my country. Sri Lanka is a member of the Asia Pacific Group on money laundering and therefore compliance with the FATF recommendation is being monitored by them. Sri Lanka has given a serious recognition to the need for preventing money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism in view of their adverse consequences, both economic and social. The country has, in fact, been a victim of terrorism financing and suffered immensely by its consequences. The Central Bank of Sri Lanka has a special concern on money laundering and terrorism financing as it has a mandate to maintain the stability of the financial system. Therefore, even before the enactment of the necessary laws, safeguards to insulate the financial system from money laundering and 
pension financing were placed through the available laws at the disposal of the central bank, such as Exchange Control Act, Customs Ordinance, and Banking Act. Adequate reporting requirements were imposed to monitor large cross product flows of currencies. And as far back as in 2001, know your customer KYC guidelines were issued to all banks urging adherence to adherence when dealing with clients and counterparties. The necessary legislation was introduced as early as in 2005 and 2006 by enacting three laws, namely the Conven Convention on the Suppression of Terrorist Financing Act, the Prevention of Mind Laundering Act, and the Financial Transaction Reporting Act, under which the FIU, with regulatory powers and a mandate to formulate policies and guidelines in line with the international standards and recommendations. In October 2016, the FATF announced that Sri Lanka would be subject to a review of International Cooperation Review Group of the FATF to assess the progress of AML CFT effectiveness in the country. After several discussions and progress reports, they indicated that Sri Lanka has not made sufficient progress in certain areas. In fact, they identified the four main areas. As a result, in October 2017, Sri Lanka was included in the gray list of FATF. The year 2019 was a very successful year in, in strengthening the MLS CFT regime of the country. One of the main tasks of the Financial Intelligence Unit of Sri Lanka was to complete the FATF action plan to deal with Sri Lanka from the gray list with the support of all the stakeholders. Central Bank of Sri Lanka's uh, coordinated efforts were finally endorsed by delisting Sri Lanka from the FATF gradies. Going forward in uh, 2021, FIU slammed penalties on leading commercial banks and licensed finance companies for non-compliance. So these are the status of uh, the Sri Lanka. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I wish to state that professionals are the backbone of a country's forward march. And while concentrating the AML and combating terrorism financing, you need to help the anti-corruption program of your country as well, even though it can ever be eliminated, but at least to reduce it to the extent possible. Therefore, the challenge today is not the inadequacy of standards. The challenge is the commitment and implementation of recommendation. In short, effective and efficient action by all stakeholders to stop money laundering, to reduce the harm caused by crime and terrorism. I wish the seminar all success. Thank you all. Over to you, Mr. Ram. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, with the conclusion of the keen speech, I would like I would now like to invite our first speaker uh, to share some insight and knowledge about the customer due diligence and the record keeping requirement. Uh, I would like to request Mr. Shivarama Prasad, Dr. Shivarama Prasad, to please share some light on the this customer due diligence requirement. Uh, Dr. Shivarama Prasad is a qualified professional in cost accountancy, company secretary, finance commerce, insurance, and banking with an experience of 36 years in the banking and financial industry with cross-cultural experience and good knowledge in the insurance sector. Mr. Prasad has been awarded PhD for the thesis role of automated teller machine in modern banking. He has been associated with the State Bank of India. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.
So good evening to all. First of all, thanks to Safa for inviting me for this uh, awareness section on AML and uh, countering the financing of terrorism. And uh, I'm Dr. P. Sivarama Prasad. I'm from India and I worked in uh, the India's largest bank, that is uh, State Bank of India. My topic is on due diligence and the record keeping. The due, today's uh, that particular agenda is the due diligence as well as the record keeping. In India also, whatever the public sector or favorite sector or foreign banks or regional road banks or cooperative banks, whatever the financial system is said, not only the banking system, but also the capital market or money market, all systems are fully implemented the KYC and the AML guidelines issued by the regulators. And the regulators also from time to time, they are giving the best world standards and these standards are also implemented in the country. Now, today's topic is, my topic is on due diligence and record keeping. What is a due diligence? Whether it is a business organization or the financial institution, whenever they are getting the customers or clients, then they have to verify the clients, they have to verify the customer. Is there any risk on inviting that particular customer to my business fold? Whenever the banks are mobilizing the deposits or opening the fixed deposits or whatever the loans and advances they are giving, the thorough scrutiny of the customer is very much required. That's why it is called as a know your customer. The customer diligence, particularly the customer diligence is very, very important. It is a process of gather customer data and evaluate the risk category of the customer. So once I have identified a high risk customer, leave it of the profit, the image of the organization will spoil. That's why generally the know your customer is a kind of a basic scrutiny about the customer, about the risk exposure of the business. That is very, very important. Otherwise, it kills the profitability of the organization it uh, increases the or uh, image risks of the organization will spoil like that. So lack of a due diligence process in any organization, whether it is a financial organization or any other business organization, including professional, once the due diligence is missing, they are inviting the high risk to the organization. Not only that one, image risk. Once the due diligence is not happening and the organization is uh, the bad image, the goodwill of the organization will tarnish and the media will cover in this organization they are doing some wrong things. They are inviting the customers, the wrong customers like that. And not only this one, once I have mobilized the correct customer, then organization image will increase. Not only this one, the bottom line of the organization is very important. Once I have chosen the wrong customer who is doing wrong things, then it uh, decreases the, my bottom line, that is a profit. I may incur the losses also due to import, due to paying the penalties uh, to the regulator, et cetera. And the stoppage of the operations of the business organizations, once I am doing raw, they inviting the wrong customer and uh, I'm doing the business with the wrong customers, uh, then the stoppage of the business. This was uh, happening. This is, uh, that's why due diligence is to be strengthened uh, in almost all organization, whether it is a financial organization or the business organization. That's why prevention is uh, better than cure. So once that is happened, uh, and uh, if at all we are paying the fine, instead of not paying the fine, the prevention is better than the cure. That should not, that's why screen the customer, diagnose the customer, 
whether the customer is a good customer or not to my business organization or whether I am going to develop the relationship with the customer or not, uh, that is a prerequisite uh, in any business organization, including the financial uh, institutions. In today's environment, particularly the business regulatory climate, climate a business should only the concern with the profits, making profits, but it should also attempt to uh, know who it has been dealing with. I may get more profit by choosing the wrong customers. That is, the profit is not the criteria. The corporate governance is the criteria. This means identifying and verifying the customer identities uh, meeting the KYC guidelines. Once I am meeting the KYC guidelines, if at all I am choosing the customer best, best customer, then my organization image will increase, profit will increase, whatever the risks, uh, I'm not going to face it. When the financial institution create a new business partnership with the individuals or any companies, take for example, banks, they're uh, inviting the individuals as a customers and a business organization like companies, partnerships, limited liabilities, uh, partnership, uh, societies, uh, et cetera, et cetera without fully knowing their past and the present business dealing, it can pose the hefty lawsuits and also regulatory fines. To stop that one, the know your customer due diligence is very much required in almost all organization. In fact, for the past uh, 10 years, regulatory across the USA or Europe or Asia Pacific and Middle East have levied in nearly $26 billion. In the financial penalties against the financial administration for non-compliance of a KYC AML and the sanctions related violations also. So we can avoid this one by screening the customer. Once the wrong customers are chosen or without the due diligence, that is a customer due diligence, then the problems will arise to the organization. Then hence due diligence is now the order of the day. It is an advanced version of the customer due diligence. We are adopting a enhanced due diligence. In the KYC process, that provides a greater level of scrutiny, potential business partnership, and the highlights that it cannot be detected at the customer due diligence. In the customer due diligence, uh, only the proofs that are available with the customer, whether it is an address proof or identity proof we are verifying, that is not sufficient nowadays. The enhanced due diligence is very much required. It is an extra step. It is an advanced approach uh, when compared to the customer due diligence. The enhanced due diligence goes beyond the customer due diligence and it looks established a high level of identity assurance. I have to scan the customer and the past, the present, and the future, whether it is a risk customer to my business or not. Obtaining the customer identity and addressing, evaluating the risk category of the customer. If we all have chosen uh, the nil risk or uh, low risk customer, then it is a smooth sailing of my business. And enhanced due diligence is uh, for dealing with the high risk, high net worth uh, customers and large transactions. The enhanced due diligence is very much required uh, for high net worth individuals. If at all, uh, more than one crore transactions uh, in the financial system, uh, the customers are to be scrutinized by the bank uh, thoroughly. That is, uh, initially, we have identified that customer as a high-risk customer. And the politically exposed person, persons also, we have identified uh, them as a high net worth individual, like uh, the political exposure also, high risk to the organization. These customer transactions are pose greater risk to the organization, to the financial sector also. Heavily regulated and monitored in order to 
and show that everything is up and down. That's why daily the IT systems in India, the core banking system, always the additional patch that is a know your customer software is also attached. Thereby, it monitors the transactions of the every customer, whether it is a small customer or a big customer. Any suspicious transactions are there, then the system will pick up and it put in the dashboard of the system. And it has a due diligence from the regulatory policies. Rigorous and robust system is very much required. The enhanced due diligence is a much rigorous and robust system. If at all weak systems are there, it is a very difficult to find out the wrong customers, which requires significantly more evidence and data. Detailed information is required. Not normal information. Normal information is not suffice to identify whether it is a low or medium or high risk customer. Detailed documentation is also required. The enhanced due diligence, entire enhanced due diligence must be uh, documented in detail and the regulator should be able to immediate access the enhanced due diligence. Whenever the regulator wants the full information of the customer, instantly that is to be provided that too through IT system. I should not give any time. Immediately they can retrieve through online only. It demands more scrutiny when it comes to how the data capture and the validity and the reliability of this uh, information success. That is very important. When the, my regulator is asking about a X or Y or Z customer, immediately how to provide that to instinct that is possible also through enhanced due diligence. Reasonable assurance is also required. Once the enhanced due diligence requirements are there, reasonable assurance uh, while calculating the KYC risk rating also. The KYC risk rating is the order of the day because uh, all the customers of any business organization, uh, there are different three categories, uh, the low or medium or high. This means the professional responsible making go or no go decision. Whether to accept the customer, not to accept the customer, it depends upon the professions. Must have completed the research and the necessary research steps. It is as good as a research step. Once I have taken a, on board the, the best customer organization smooth signing and uh, exercise the professional skills and carried reaching the judgment. Not only this one, special attention for that accounts, the politically exposed persons. The special attention must be paid to politically exposed persons. They are viewed as a high risk customer because of their uh, positions that can be potentially abused with the money laundering. That's why the customer due diligence is uh, very, very important. Enhanced customer due diligence is uh, advanced version of uh, the details and the in-depth research analysis of the customer is required because uh, the long-term relationship of the customer means uh, the initial scrutiny should be strengthened. One of the challenges of uh, accident is the due diligence, how much information about the customer necessary to be collected. The enhanced uh, due diligence regulators have consistently, consistently favored approach of the financial institution the leverage, the document and policies and procedure. From time to time, the regulators in the business, the regulators in the financial system, the regulators in the capital market, uh, all are uh, from time to time, they are developing the policies, they are uh, rationalizing the policies uh, in the present country uh, conditions, uh, what type of uh, scrutiny is required uh, to be done by the financial system or capital market system or the business system automated AML screen that to provide the sufficient assurance uh, enabling the regulators uh, to electronically audited decisions uh, made by the profession. Nowadays, instant uh, the information should be available. 
based on the data warehousing, data mining, it is possible to screen the customer whether the customer is a good customer or bad customer. Increasing companies are combating, combining the online validity of the AML screening during the account on board. Once I am opening the account and once I am inviting the customer on board, effectively, I'm uh, killing the two birds with one stone. That is a single and automated system. I have to satisfy the verification of the customer as well as uh, the AML screening also. Once uh, the two are instantly available, I am in safe. My business organization is safe condition. The regulator news. Every time the regulators and news are there, the regulators impose a penalty on financial system and the corporates non compliance of KYC to avoid, to arrest, to mitigate that type of uh, this one. Uh, the penalty is uh, the screening is uh, very much it. It is uh, as good as a body screening, that is a CT scan. So, a body, whatever the disease is there, it is to be screened with the CT scan. That type of system is to be the robust system and the advanced systems are to be developed to safeguard the business organization, to safeguard the financial system of the country. The customers are to be categorized in three segments, the low risk customer, the medium risk customer, the high risk customer. But the second and the third customers are closely, regularly to be monitored by the business organization. The business organizations as well as the financial institutions of the capital market, whoever is there, that is the continuous effort, not a one-time measure. It is a continuous process as long as the customer is with the business. IT systems of the organization should be really restricted. The advanced versions of the business intelligence. The BA, the data warehousing, data mining, lot of advanced versions of the IT systems are also available. The IT systems should be automatically generated. <clears throat> the human intervention to be minimized on a regular and a continuous basis to generate exception report of the customer for due diligence to generate the suspicious transaction of the customer to for the due diligence and the transactions above the threshold limit, uh, the due diligence also. These are to be verified by the designated officials like uh, chief risk officer and the actions are to be initiated. That type of uh, practices are uh, following in almost all organization uh, in the financial system, business system, and the capital market system in the country. Record keeping. What is the record keeping? Once I have identified the customer, I'm taking the document, various documents at the time of uh, starting the relationship. And these documents are to be preserved. The time period is also defined. Once uh, any doubts, any clarifications are required, I should be in a position to clarify. I have to uh, in a position to submit the original documents to the regulatory authority or law authorities. Keeping the records, the customer identity, transactions is a social component of uh, anti-money laundering regulations. Companies uh, that are obliged to comply with the re regulations uh, and uh, that uh, that. Uh, uh, they, 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 this type of uh, essential component of money laundering uh, regulations. Companies that are obliged to comply with the regulations are uh, money laundering, prevention of records and controls. All are to be preserved as long as uh, the relationship of the customer is uh, continued with the organization. Firms uh, are required to keep the records. Customer identity transactions as a proof of work performed to comply with the local regulatory and the legal obligation, the records are to be maintained. In suspicious cases, the records are to be maintained, fund forward to the law enforcement, and the law enforcement can conduct the investigation based on the records submitted by the organizations. These records can be used as an evidence by the companies in if law enforcement conducts investigation in suspicious 
activities. Companies should adequate records appropriate to the business complexity, the scale, the nature, the may make them accessible required by the local regulation. All are instantly there. So at the same time, the company should keep the such records up to date. Even in the KYC, it is not one time measure. On a regularly, that is to be updated. Even in uh, India, the KYC documents are regularly updated. Not at the time of uh, starting the, uh, the starting the relationship with the customer. It is an ongoing process. So that they should not manage the communication with the customer. Well, in order to update the information, the records of the company should differ depending upon the regulation. They are subjected to jurisdiction. In most of the countries, the record keeping, how long the record is to be kept, what type of records are to be kept, all are defined as standardized also. But most of the fundamental purpose of reporting standard is ensure that the firm can provide detailed identification, tracking audit trial should the firm's client investigate. Whatever the record is there, that records are to be maintained by me. And here also, the defining customer information, the transactions, and the money laundering reporting officer annual reports, all are required. External and internal suspicious reports are required, and investigation records are required, and information that is not a processor that is also to be maintained by the business organizations as well as financial organizations. Actions are to be taken as a result of agency requests, training and compliance monitoring, and information about the effectiveness of the training. The KYC or AML, the training is also conducted by the organization. Even the financial system, all employees, all employees are to be undergone that particular training. And the information about the effectiveness, once the training is happened to the employees of the financial institution or a business organization, how it is impacted, whether the risk rate is reduced or not. The time, compliance, and monitoring, and the actions are taken as a result of our agents, all are the, the standardized in most of the countries. How to keep the customer identity transactions? The way to keep the records are local or global regulatory records and the retention rules that are to be followed. Even uh, the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, uh, that is, uh, whatever the records uh, the regulators are defined in, in the country that uh, the financial institutions are strictly implemented through particularly the original documents are to be written or a computerized form or scanned form or microfiche, all types of uh, that information is to be available. Regarding creates or rules are not merely affected the format which the records are kept. However, the records are accessible, easily accessible, no time. Because once the action is to be initiated, the retrieval of the record is to be instantly available to the investigation authorities. It is usually not set place a regulation where the records are to be kept, all are defined clearly, and it can be retired without undue delay. That is the main object of record keeping. In addition, companies have responsibility to ensure the records outside the home country meets the same recording requirements. After the records are requested, the relevant law enforcement authorities are subject to ongoing investigation and the records are to be kept in the retained until the firm is notified the relevant authority for that case is closed. Suppose the firm is not notified on ongoing investigation within a five years, making the statement. In that case, records can also often be destroyed according to the normal local the jurisdiction and this one. So uh, this sir, is uh, in brief. Sir, about sure, that. Sir. Uh, Sorry to interrupt, uh, we are getting a bit uh, late in time. So if you can uh, conclude, please. So the due diligence and recorded to conclude the objective of a KYC AML and combating the financial the terrorism guidelines to prevent the banks from being used intentionally or unintentionally by criminal elements, money laundering or a terrorism finance sector. This is uh, in brief about uh, the 
AML, particularly the due diligence and a recording kit. Thank you very much for giving an opportunity to discuss about this one. Thank you very much, sirs. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shivarama, for the for very detailed insight on the customer due diligence and the record keeping requirements. Uh, for the participants, I would like to highlight that if there are any questions, you can uh, post your question in the question answer section of this uh, Zoom link, and all your questions will be answered uh, at the end of the session. So moving forward, uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Adnan Imran uh, to share some insight and knowledge regarding the suspicious transaction reporting requirement uh, under the uh, FATF legislation. Mr. Adnan Imran is a seasoned banker and an experienced AML CFT professional. Mr. Imran is currently serving as director in financial monitoring unit, which is the fin financial intelligence unit of Pakistan. He has an experience of more than two decades. Previously, he was associated with the State Bank of Pakistan at senior management level. He has been involved in the compliance reviews of FATCA, AML, CFT, TFS, Prudential Regulations, and Basel Compliance Requirement. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, can you see the screen, please? If you can slide show, it will be more better. Hmm. At the bottom right corner, you will find the button for the slideshow. Thank you. Is it better? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rail Saab. Uh, thank you, uh, esteemed panelists. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, thank you to the keynote speakers. Um, uh, thank you, ICAP, for inviting Financial Monitoring Unit to uh, uh, present this topic. Uh, I'll just keep uh, brief uh, my comments uh, because uh, most of the uh, this uh, session is going live, so uh, they can read the details from the slides. Uh, Basically, we should uh, come back to the uh, topic at hand is that uh, accountants, uh, what role they have and how uh, they are being, uh, they can be misutilized uh, for money laundering and terrorist finance and proliferation financing. So they are known as gatekeepers and um, many businesses and uh, professional uh, clients use them uh, to uh, various, uh, for various services which can distance them from their uh, uh, from their, uh, uh, from their uh, assets, which may be ill-gotten, and they can still uh, take benefit of the proceeds of those assets. So these kinds of um, uh, gatekeeper services, which are uh, given by accountants, can be misused. Now, FATF has uh, given uh, various recommendations uh, for uh, the DNVP sectors. Uh, briefly, there are three, uh, 22, 23, and uh, 28. Now, uh, 22 relates to the customer due diligence, uh, which uh, uh, Prasad Saab, Dr. Prasad Saab uh, gave a detailed presentation on. And now I'll uh, also uh, uh, give some linkages with the CDT and also how uh, R23, which is about uh, reporting of suspicious transaction, links with it. Uh, then Rahil Saab will go on to R28, which, uh, which is about supervision of DNFBPs. Now, uh, briefly, FATF has provided some guidances on these areas. Uh, one of the recent ones is about the accountants, which was published in 2019. Uh, interesting thing is that uh, while we were implementing uh, these uh, requirements in Pakistan, in our country also, uh, we came to the accountants first and we had a public-private partnership with them and we developed jointly these regulations. Um, and these were used as a template for all other sectors of the DNFBP. Uh, I see the same uh, kind of flow going in uh, FATF also. Uh, recently, FATF has updated these guidances, and uh, these were last updated in 2009 and 2008. And more, when they started re-updating, the first ones they came to light was about the accountants and the legal professionals. So the good thing about this is that uh, they are professionals in their field. They know the internal control areas. 
they already have international standards they provide consultancies to various businesses so they have got the relevant knowledge at hand so for us it is the most easiest sector and the most easiest uh, reporting entities to work with because they are knowledgeable in that area and they re readily adapt to it and the way they adapt to it is very clinical also so uh, now what is the uh, interest of the jurisdiction that is our countries um, in adopting these um, uh, requirements now the issue is that uh, uh, whenever uh, a, a jurisdiction uh, adopts these uh, requirements these have to be uh, adopted uh, in a in a coordinated fashion it's a two way street uh, the regulator themselves and the regulated entities they have to do lots of work together so it's more of a partnership with the private uh, sector the public sector and the private sector have to do all these uh, accomplishments uh, in partnership with each other and and to uh, give a, a playing a playing level playing field uh, to all the reporting entities they have to ensure that those who voluntarily comply are rewarded and they are helped and they are assisted in their efforts and those who do not um, are fined and um, are dissuasively uh, uh, clamped down on now uh, many uh, technical side work has to be done uh, lots of assignments have to be done but the issue is that um, if you look at it um, without the private partnership it cannot be accomplished so the government can make laws regulations sops systems uh, but uh, till the time that the private entity comes forward internalizes those guidances those templates those uh, uh, reporting systems and adopts them uh, it cannot move forward and when they adopt them then the supervisor can can and do the on site and off site supervision because without those supervisory uh, you can only do supervisory uh, actions if your uh, private sector is actually doing aml safety compliance so it's very important that both the private and public sector have a partnership in place uh, and just because this is the safa um, uh, forum so let's see if where uh, our countries are uh, nepal as uh, hari saab will tell you it is uh, uh, going uh, it is going to host a mer session soon so we will so see their progress uh, in a few months time india will also be hosting their mer uh, maybe next year uh, for the rest of the safa countries we can see that uh, most of the countries are largely or fully compliant in r20 that is the customer due diligence requirements and the r23 which is the reporting of str and ctr requirements uh, the the progress that is required is the r28 that is the supervision part now the, the challenge there is that it includes an aspect of effectiveness r22 and 23 are technical compliance they are achieved by putting in place laws regulations but those systems and those procedures have to be complied with they have to be acting upon it and they have to be supervised so that is the effectiveness part which is r28 so the real challenge comes at the r28 level and um, most of the safa countries are doing well and progressing well now if we look at this overall picture we uh, just take a step back and see uh, where we have to start from you have to realize that it is a risk based approach right the r1 of fatf is risk basis so first of all an organization has to identify and understand its risks it has to assess them and it has to document them and it has to put in place a commensurate uh, cpf uh, aml safety and cpf program uh, according to the challenges at hand and then implement them so uh, as as dr uh, prasad saab said that the cdd is the most important part of that so cdd is at the heart of the uh, uh, aml safety program and uh, it there it's not optional you we have to uh, do it and uh, if if cdd is not uh, implemented then the tr transactions have to be uh, terminated so so it's very important that everybody knows how to do cdd how it should not affect your business and how it do, do it commensurately according to the risk now cdd in itself is very simple thing you just need to know the name of the customer their address um, are they acting on the behalf of someone um, are why are they selling the reason for that transaction and then monitor the relationship as dr prasad saab said the challenge comes when it is the the risk area comes in it now how the risk area comes in in place in the cdd it comes in place through the information given to any regulated entity at the super national level that is the national risk assessment 
and your AML safety regulator that provides the sectoral risk assessment, and then your FIU and your regulator, which provides you the uh, relevant typologies, case studies, red flags, and indicators. And then that, all of them are internalized into their internal risk assessment. And then they are implemented and the uh, customer uh, due diligence becomes the risk-based uh, process. Now, uh, the challenge, as Dr. Prasad Saab said, comes when it's the high-risk customer. Now, high-risk customers, uh, as an example, are uh, perhaps they, are, they can be your high-risk businesses, they can be in the uh, businesses in high-risk geographies, they can be uh, high-risk um, corporate structures, they can be high-risk channels. So we have to keep in mind. Now, FETF gives uh, a very uh, simple uh, process for uh, one of the high-risk uh, areas, which is the PEPs. And uh, for enhanced due diligence in the PEPs, we have to have uh, a risk management process to identify those PEPs. And then have, we have to have uh, enhanced CDD, uh, taking into account their source of wealth, their source of income, and also get higher level of approval for commensurate with that higher risk for uh, initializing or keeping that uh, business in place. And then doing uh, enhanced uh, ongoing monitoring that is reducing the intervals of monitoring. Now, uh, as we said in the start that it's a two-way street. So um, uh, definitely if um, a reporting entity uh, puts in place a very risk averse system and uh, um, then definitely the customers are going out uh, of their uh, business and going to another business which has maybe a higher risk appetite and a lower controls environment. Now here the uh, work of the supervisor becomes very important because the supervisor has to ensure the leveling playing field between these uh, reporting entities. It has to ensure that everybody is doing CDD on equal quality and they are doing it according to the risk and the risk as they increase, the level of controls are increasing accordingly. And they have to check that uh, when the level increases, definitely that's the PEP, the high risk jurisdiction, high risk channels, high risk services areas. So what the uh, business is doing in that field, how it is doing enhanced diligence for them. Now, uh, when we talk about high risk, um, we have to keep in mind that the DNFPP uh, uh, sector or uh, accountants, uh, they have been uh, put, uh, uh, the recommendations for them from uh, FATF are based on high risk. So their services, their products, which are susceptible to ML, TF, and proliferation financing, they are directly uh, being attended or addressed by the uh, FATF recommendations. They can be formation. Uh, uh, the crux of the matter is that uh, making, forming, managing of the legal entity, legal arrangements, selling and buying, and then uh, selling and buying of uh, uh, property, and then managing assets, uh, performing financial transactions for your clients, and giving tax advice. So these are uh, vulnerable areas which have to be looked into. Uh, now, if this, uh, these are vulnerable uh, services that are being provided by the accountants, then definitely anything that is added onto it as high risk increases that risk. Now, for example, if the client behavior is uh, showing high risk, um, a client uh, has negative news uh, in the uh, media, uh, definitely, and he wants that services. So it adds on that uh, risk factor in it. Similarly, if the transaction pattern or the channel being used by the customer also adds on to the same transaction. That is, the same client also wants to do the transaction to cash. Um, so that adds on to that. And in the last, if, if that client uh, has a business also uh, which has uh, links with a high risk jurisdiction uh, or a weak jurisdiction with AML safety, uh, weak AML safety controls. So these four sectors are coming together to show a high risk uh, factor and enhanced due diligence has to be done. Now, uh, keep in mind that when we say that enhanced due diligence has to be done, that uh, does not mean reporting of STR. It simply means that you have to ask more questions in, as we discussed in the case of PEPS, go in depth, commensurate with the risk and ask more questions, get more documentation, do a stronger verification process. Now, if that process is successfully completed, then definitely the transaction will go ahead. If during that process, a suspicion is uh, a suspicion arises that the client is doing ML, TF, or PF, then definitely that is where the STR is uh, reported. Now, uh, 
These are the thresholds uh, where STRs are normally reported to FIUs. Every FIU give in their jurisdiction a prioritization of predicate offenses, uh, similarly in our and any other jurisdiction. So it depends from FIU to FIU jurisdiction and their risk profile. So uh, if there's a, a intention of doing illegal thing or a, 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 a client is doing illegal thing which an accountant detects or it is involved in terrorism financing or terrorism itself, or it has it is a positive match is uh, with UNC, uh, UNSCR screening list that is the 1267-1373. But in those cases uh, where the CDT cannot be uh, fully uh, completed and you are not able to find out, then you should uh, abort the transaction and then you should also uh, report an SDR. And wherever uh, the client is avoiding reporting thresholds and you see suspicious behavior of the clients, and then also that uh, is a place where uh, an STR should be reported to the FIU. Now, this is an area where the FIU works with the reporting entities and guides them and prior uh, helps them prioritize them. Uh, the IT systems of the FIU has options in which you can tag uh, your uh, uh, suspicious transaction report as under one of these predicate offenses or any other predicate offenses that you see there. For example, human trafficking, smuggling, or any other uh, issue that you see corruption, uh, and that can be tagged with it. And the FIUs use their, those tags to prioritize the STR sent uh, to them. Now, the important thing here, here is that uh, tipping off should be avoided uh, wherever you are uh, reporting STR, you should avoid tipping off your customer. Confidentiality of the STR should be ensured. It should not be told anyone um, uh, that the STR has been reported. And the institution, uh, the, the jurisdiction should have a safe harbor in the law. And uh, the safe harbor is a balance, check and balance so that it, it incentivizes the reporting entity to report suspicious transaction report. So whoever reports a suspicious transaction report, they get safe harbor in the law uh, from uh, future investigations. So it's a kind of an incentive. Prompt reporting can be emphasized. It needs to be emphasized. It needs to be promptly reported. Now, just to keep a quality of uh, uh, SDR reporting uh, within uh, accounting uh, practice, uh, one should ensure that there's a full-time or at least uh, experienced uh, compliance uh, officer at hand, and he is um, uh, dedicated to uh, doing compliance functions, and those STRs should be internally reported to them, and then uh, that resource, which is fully dedicated to compliance and STR reporting, should do, ensure, uh, do quality assurance, and also ensure that a standard, minimum standard, which a FIU requires in STR should be met, and if it is a, a minimum standard of the suspicion is not met, uh, that STR should not be reported. So, so it has. It, there needs to be a suspicion, uh, on reasonable grounds to report, or a knowledge of predicate offense to report an STR. Now, reporting an STR, the best practice is keep it short, keep it logical, keep it simple, uh, do paragraphing uh, so that the reader can easily understand. Keep in mind that this is just the starting point. The STR reporting is just the starting point. After you report the STR, it needs to be processed by the FIUs. Based on that, they will develop a financial intelligence, which may be uh, disseminated to a law enforcement agency, which will do a carry out an investigation on it. So, so it's just the start of the process. So the start of the process, you need to give the relevant information in your suspicious transaction report to the FIUs. Now, even if that uh, suspicious transaction report is not utilized for financial intelligence to law enforcement agencies, a, 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 a good quality FIU will have a good quality IT system, uh, and this STR will contribute to its uh, database, and future uh, financial intelligence will be, uh, uh, the value addition will be done in maybe in the future uh, financial intelligence that may be disseminated about the same STR or maybe uh, any other STR. Now, uh, even more important, as we said that uh, the, the services provided by the DNFBPs or accountants are vulnerable. And when you take it into perspective of a cross jurisdiction, that those services are given from one jurisdiction to another, it becomes even a more higher uh, risk category. Now, um, here, when the STR being, uh, is sent to FIU, 
That STR can be used by the FIU for information sharing with other FIUs. And now we are looking at not only at national level uh, anti-money laundering framework, but an international level anti-money uh, framework, anti-money laundering framework, where more than one FIUs will come together, and investigate the case, and develop financial intelligence out of it. So, uh, Mr. Ramon, can you uh, please uh, conclude in the next few minutes? So I would be very grateful. Thank you very much. So. Uh, at the end of the day, it's in the interest of the professionals because the business of the professionals is uh, dependent on their uh, reputation and they should, uh, uh, and the jurisdiction of uh, the reputation of the jurisdiction is dependent on those professionals working in that jurisdiction. So it's very important that all the stakeholders, the customers, uh, the uh, accountants, and the relevant AML CFT regulator should work together uh, in a partnership and uh, ensure the integrity of the system in place. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Adnan. Thank you for your very detailed and insightful presentation. Uh, without wasting any time, I would now like to request Mr. Hari Kumar Nepal, Dr. Hari Kumar Nepal, to share some insight regarding the internal controls under the FET of monitoring uh, compliance. Uh, Mr. Hari Kumar, Dr. Hari Kumar is the Deputy Director of Nepal Rostra Bank, the Central Bank of Nepal, and is currently working in, for the AML cell of the Ministry of Finance and the AML CFT Mutual Evaluation Secretariat of the Office of the Prime Minister and Council of the Ministers. Mr. Nepal has a wider experience in AML CFT regime for more than a decade. He had the experience of working as an AML CFT assessor and reviewer in the evaluation of number of countries. Mr. Nepal is MA, LLM, and PhD in the AML CFT in legal matters in SAR countries, as well as, as a certified anti money laundering professional. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sahil. First of all, I'd like to extend my gratitude to Shafa and ICAP for being so pre for, for being so pro proactive in organizing this AML CFT program for accounting sector professionals. It's a really unique, innovative, and new one. So I would like to congratulate you and I would like to praise you again for having such kind of initiatives. Uh, at the same time, I would like to express my gratitude to ICANN, that is regulator here for accounting professionals, and especially to Mr. Suraj Kapli, uh, sir, who really connected me with you. And I'm indebted to him too. And the presidents of ICAP, Safa, and other officials, uh, as well as uh, uh, respected speakers. My title here is that without wasting time and other formal things, I would like to directly go to the issues. Uh, on internal controls and AML CFT, particularly in relation to accounting professionals and, uh, and their services, whatever they provide. I would briefly, uh, how, how I would like to go is that I will briefly, uh, I would like to briefly start with uh, some of the generic issues and go to the specific one that are related with the accounting professionals. So what I will do that I will go to accounting, the principles set by FATF and who may be the AML CFT players in the country and what are the building blocks in the AML CFT matters and what rules the accounting professional should perform to so undergo and finally the prospects and issues that we might have. This is how I would like to go briefly and then short. As you all of us know that, and the chair also say deliver in his speech that FATF has its recommendation issued in 2012, and it, it is still, it's still um, the FATF is still revisiting it and updating it. And some of the recommendations out of 40 recommendations, are, some of the recommendations are directly related with the accounting professionals, such as recommendation 22, 23, and 28. 22 and 23 are about how accounting professionals should perform their AML CFT roles, and 28 is about the how 
government authorities or regulatory or supervisory authorities should conduct supervision of accounting professionals. At the same time, there are other recommendations that are relevant to accounting professionals, such as risk assessment and risk-based approach, cooperation, coordination, international cooperation, such kind of things are also there. Some of them relate to the professional, some of them, them relate to the supervisor of the accounting professionals. And at the same time, if, if when a country is assessed, the country is assessed in two parts. One is technical part that we just saw before, and another is effectiveness part. In the effectiveness part, we have direct relation with the preventive measures and as well as supervisory measures. Now I would like to go, uh, I'd just like to show this slide to see how AML CFT system works in a country. There should be a legal basis first. There are financial institution and designated non-financial business and professional institution like, like our professionals, like accounting professionals. There are regulators, there is FIU, there are numbers of investigative authorities, there are prosecutorial and judicial authorities, and there are policy bodies, as well as international financial system, uh, which all of all, the, all these composed, all these elements or all these structures frame uh, AML CFT system in the world, both in national level and international level. However, what I would like to stress that it is the reporting entities, it is the accounting professional, it is the banking professionals, it is the insurance professionals, it is the real estate professionals or business person, they really feel breathe into the system. We were at the earth components are agencies, but the base, the, the foundation of the system is, if you ask me, are the reporting entities, the accounting professional are one of them. Now I'd like to go discuss a bit about what are the AML CFT building blocks. The earlier presentation also touched upon these things. I would just briefly would like to go on this. Any accounting professionals, what kind of services it provides, should adopt risk based approach because AML CFT is a demanding subject, demanding regime. If you try to have every possible thing, if you try to apply every possible thing to all, I think we cannot run our profession. Show it that. It, this has been understood globally. This has been understood nationally. So this has been reflected in regulatory directives. This has been reflected in national laws. So uh, an accounting firm or a banking institution is required to conduct its institutional risks and focus on those areas where there are high risks or large, uh, medium risks or medium high risks. And the, 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 the building blocks also require that there should be a policy, there should be a procedure of a, a, an accounting form that address the risk-based approach. Means suppose in my country, a particular business sector is quite vulnerable to money laundering, that policy and procedure should capture that. And that risk-based approach should have touched upon that, discussed that, analyzed that, and stated that this, this sector is vulnerable for money laundering and financing because of these, these things, because of these statistics, because of this logic. So risk-based approach means, first of all, we have to conduct our institutional risk assessment based upon national risk assessment, sectoral risk assessment, or other risk assessment. And the findings of this risk assessment should be reflected in the policy and procedure of an institutions, in the CDD, CDD measures, in the monitoring measures, in the reporting measures, in the compliance program, in the record keeping, in the capacity building, in the review and appraisal of whatever a firm is doing. So this is what mix AML CFT regime for reporting entities. This may be a bit different for regulator, a bit different for uh, investigation agencies, but I would like to um, see lots of these things in relation to reporting entities only. Now, while going to the core issue given to me, the accounting professionals are have their traditional profession of accounting and auditing globally. So the auditing function is one part. And the, the role assigned by FATF standard is a bit different. It does not mean that an accounting professional should work as a reporting entity while conducting audit function. 
while carrying out audit function. So what FATF has said, or it's limited that if any accountants or any auditors or any accounting professional is engaged in the preparation of, in the transaction of, of say when they prepare for or carry out a transaction of the client concerning the following activities means if an accountant is involved in buying and selling of real estate on behalf of his customer or client then at that time the accountant is supposed to be reporting entity in aml cfd perspective if it is doing audit function that is a different thing that is a different role that is a different capacity there are there, the norms and guidelines for audit function uh, that, that have been traditionally developed and growing, you see, expanding more and more as per the challenge. So if an accountant is engaged in managing of, of client money or securities and other assets, if it is engaged in, he is engaged in the management of bank or saving or securities of accounts, if it is engaged in the organization of contribution for the creation, operation, and management of legal person or companies, if it is engaged in creating or operating or management of legal person or arrangement or buying or selling of the business, if an accountant, by virtue of its li the license it has obtained from the regulator or government, carries out such kind of activities, at that time, as per the FATF recommendation, should work as a reporting entity. For auditing, there is a different role, which we will be discussing later. So FATF is covering only this part is a reporting entity or reporting professionals or DNFPP. So that is what I would like to focus on here. We should not be worried for so many things. As a reporting entity or as a professional engaged in, as, as an accounting a professional, you see, engaged in such kind of activities. Now, I would like to separate these two functions. One, we accountants, we lawyers, are working as reporting entity or reporting professionals as per recommendation 22 and 23 of FATF recommendation. In that context, we have to comply with the building blocks of AML CFT that I presented before and other respected speakers also presented on that. But the issue of internal com control comes here that how we are internalizing that function within our form. What kind of policy we have framed? What kind of procedure we have framed? What kind of staffs we have hired? What are the measures of hiring ethical staffs? What kind of ethical grounds we have maintained over the year? Or it also depends on the size of accounting firm. If the accounting firm is like KPMG, the risk assessment report it produces may be a, a, may be a document of voluminous pages. If there is a single, uh, an accounting firm having one single accountant and limited to domestic business, domestic services, the risk assessment may be different. So the risk assessment depends on the size of its business, its services, its makeup. And at the same time, who are the persons, who are the bodies, who are the companies or whatever we say, we are providing the service. This means our customers. Is our customer a business, business person? Is our customer a politically exposed person? Is, is our person customers are those who have been suspected for tax evasion or terrorism? Or there is someone behind who is in fact running or trying to run the or establish the business. If a, an accounting firm has such kind of instruments develop within it to look after the issues, then we can say that it is properly working or in line with the expectation of in measures under inter internal controls. That is what I would like to focus here. At the same time, if an accounting firm is a big one, provides multinational services, at that time, we should also grasp the risk areas of that particular country. Just for an example, though it is related with the lawyers, the Panama paper. The Panama paper is famous where in the matter of discussion is an issue for the world because the lawyer was providing service to establish company 
or to work as an agent of certain person or certain companies are running the management of that companies. And in fact, it was hiding the real person who was the actual owner or beneficial owner. So what kind of instruments we have developed within our firm based on our scope of business, size of business, nature of business, or area where we are serving? If we have that kind of capacity built up in documentation, in the knowledge of board of directors, in the knowledge of our skill of senior management, in the knowledge of our skill of the employees, we have trained show, then we can say that our internal control system is quite effective. So that is what it expects. If our business form, our accounting form is multinational, suppose that's in Nepal, that's in Pakistan, that's in India, that's in US, at that time, what kind of mechanism, measures in a top level, in a multinational level, it has developed so that a money launderer or a terror financer, financer or a criminal cannot abuse or cannot try to abuse we people or our firm so that we do not be victim in the future as a criminal or associate of the criminals. This is what, in fact, is expected in internal control measures. That is what I would like to focus first. Then I'll get back again to the slide. What I would like to stress upon here is that in the internal controls, we should be very cautious whether our firm has the existence of AML CFD building blocks in a visible matter or not, number one. Number two, if we have that those building blocks in visible form, are they in operating status? Are they really working? Does our staff know that? Does he have skills or instruments or idea to implement that effectively? Does he understand who is beneficial owner? Does he, does he, have, does he have a kind of sense that this guy, ha the behavior of this guy, this person who is asking service from us, you see, has connection with the terrorism or terrorist activities. So if this is systematically inbuilt within the function of that accounting form at that time, we can say that there is very good internal control system. And we finally, whether this is effective or not, it, it depends on what, by doing our own, having so many documents and trainings alone does not establish effectiveness. Effectiveness is established when a regulator, FIU and other people, you see, feel that you have contributed to AML CFT system. Suppose your firm has not been you see, attempted by, has, uh, criminals have not attempted to use you, your form as a vehicle, or you have identified such kind of criminal elements or attempts of the people, uh, people, <laughs> attempts of, of, of those kind of people are notorious people, and you have reported that to FIU a suspicious activity or suspicious transaction, what, what kind of name is there in, in a country. So regulatory is satisfied by looking after entire system in place. FIU is satisfied because it's for the geography, it's for the economic size, it's for the, it's for the, the money learning and terror financing and other criminal activities, whatever reports it has submitted, the number, the volume, the quality, the quantity, Oh, they are satisfied to our context because we cannot do everything, but we can do the best. We can try the best. So if that is visible, then we can say there is there are good internal control measures within the form. So the objective of all these things is that to not to have our form, we people abused by the criminals. Someone comes to us, approaches to us, the purpose is to establish a company, but we suspect that 
the money that he they have they, 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 they are they are trying to invest in that company has come from terrorism or they have a desire they have an intention hidden intention they have intent to pass that money to transmit that money or to supply that money in the form of business in the form of company in the form of charity to a terror organization or a corrupt guy having intent to establish establish a business entity through us to hide its corruption, his corruptions, to launder its money. So if we have that kind of eye to a certain extent established within a form, then we then at that time the FAT of is a uh, requirements of internal controls within the accounting form is supposed to have been fulfilled. So this is what I would like to stress upon one, uh, one side. Another side is when accounting professional work is uh, auditors, uh, then they sir, have sorry, additional... Sorry. sorry to interrupt if you can conclude in uh, next... Episode. Right, sure, sure. Um, yeah. If they are working as auditor, at that time, if they are auditor of reporting entity, how far reporting entity, suppose bank, are complying the AML safety measures effectively, that's their another role that I would like to focus. Finally, Nepal, in the context of Nepal, we have AML laws, regulatory directives, AML policies, and nationalist assessment. And there are some challenges we have felt, though we have found our ICANN, that's the regulator for accounting professionals, is very active. They have issued directives to accounting professionals engage in such kind of activities that we discuss. We have found some major problem is the some of them are that there is no clarity in understanding. And there is a problem for us in the integration adjustment of accounting professions and mixing AML norms within that. And another problem that we have found is that case versus suspicious activity. So what is case? What is suspicious activity? So this has been a big problem for us but we are in regular discussion and I can have has been doing a lot of things in this in that regard. So finally, I would like to thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ICANN. And thank you, ICAP, for giving this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rosa, for your insightful presentation. Uh, uh, the last section of our uh, awareness session is regarding the uh, regulations and supervision of DNFBPs. Uh, this session I'll conduct myself and considering the time uh, I'll try to wind up in next <clears throat> five to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, since a majority of the matters have been discussed by our esteemed panelists, uh, with regards to the obligations and also with regards to the uh, regulations of the DNFBPs, one thing I would like to uh, highlight is uh, that the DNFBPs, so why accountants fall under the ambit of the FATF, is in the FATF recommendations or in the guidance, uh, illustrative guidance, you can mostly see the word DNFBPs, uh, which has almost around four or five uh, types. And one of the type is the accountants when they prepare for or carry out certain transaction of their clients, uh, which were duly highlighted by Dr. Hari Kumar. Uh, moving forward with regards to the supervision uh, of DNFBPs, the FATF has a recommendation that is recommendation number 28, which deals with the overall supervision of the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. overall supervision of the DNFBPs. Uh, the two uh, major aspect of this uh, recommendation are uh, that number one is the whether the supervisor or the self-regulatory body, whatever the model the country is following, they should take the necessary measures uh, in order to prevent the criminals or their associates from being professionally accredited or being uh, or are the beneficial owner of any uh, accounting firm. Uh, this is basically in common word we can we call these as market entry uh, controls. And secondly, uh, the supervisor or the self-regulatory body should have an effective and proportionate dissuasive sanction. I will uh, remain uh, within the ambit of the FET of recommendations without highlighting the impact on, uh, without highlighting the practices followed by other countries, since there are multiple uh, audience from the multiple countries involved. 
Uh, what is risk-based supervision? It is basically, uh, there are certain characteristics of the risk-based supervision. I will highlight them. Uh, uh, number one, uh, the supervisor should have, should maintain a good understanding of the MLTF risk. That is, what is risk-based supervision is basically uh, focusing on the risk-based areas uh, when dealing with the supervision of the DNFBPs and uh, giving the resources, you're providing the resources towards the areas which are of higher risk without neglecting the overall aspect that is the lower or the medium risk. Uh, one of the uh, aspect of this risk-based supervision is to provide targeted or guidance and feedbacks uh, to the supervisor, to the reporting firm uh, in the form of directing the remedial action or maybe exercising enforcement action wherever necessary. Uh, there should be, uh, the supervisor should be equipped with expertise and powers in order to deal uh, with the supervision uh, in a risk-based approach. And the most important thing is as an accountant regulator, there must be a, there must be a coordination among the other regulators and law enforcement agencies as well, particularly with the FIUs of the country. Uh, as Adnan Imran mentioned that when an STR is reported and if there a regulator has a coordination with the FIU, uh, these can be dealt in accordance, uh, these can be very much helpful when assigning the risk category to any reporting firm by the regulator. Uh, concluding or just focusing on the overall features of the supervisory risk framework, there are, uh, I would say, two aspects. One is the preventive and the other one is the reactive aspect. The preventive aspect is basically regarding uh, when the regulator is applying the market entry controls at, uh, at the entry of the DNFBPs, not allowing to take license uh, without proper due diligence. Uh, Secondly, engaging with the DNFBPs or with the accounting firms in the form of off-site and on-site monitoring and the regular follow-ups. But when it comes to reactive, the, there comes the enforcement actions or the uh, action plans or the remedial action plans that are being given to the uh, DNFBPs or the reporting firm. So uh, to sum up the supervisory system uh, with regards to the uh, regulation yeah, recommendation 28, uh, the, the one approach is the preventive approach with the, which then result into the reactive approach, the overall uh, supervision system of the uh, reporting firm. Uh, the last thing which I need to mention is that there are some illustrative guidelines of the FATF. These are in detail, which can be read through these slides. But the one thing which I like to mention is uh, the regulator, when uh, starting or when commencing any supervision of the DNFBPs, there should be a clear understanding of the sector, uh, understanding of the risk of the sector uh, with regards to the sectoral risk assessment. And then towards that entity, when, you, uh, when a supervision is being done towards that entity, the regulator should have a clear knowledge of that the risk uh, of MLTF under which that specific entity to whom they are supervising is polling just in order to make sure that specific resources and if a specific uh, focus is being given uh, to that reporting firm. Uh, sec uh, secondly, the supervisor or the SR SRB should assess the adequacy of the internal control, just like uh, Mr. Hari, Dr. Hari Kumar also mentioned that we need to assess the uh, in, uh, adequacy of the internal controls of DNFPPs in order to properly uh, to take into account the overall money laundering and terrorist financing risk while making overall risk profiling of the uh, DNFBPs. The last thing is the legal structure of the uh, country should allow or should empower the regulator uh, to, care, to perform their functions, including the power to monitor and to impose any sanction in cases of any non-compliance. So this is basically a broad structure of the overall uh, regulation recommendation 28, which relates to the risk-based supervision of the uh, DNFBPs. Uh, I will stop my presentation here and will uh, take three or four uh, questions before ending the, uh, before moving towards the closing remarks. Uh, one of the question, although it was uh, responded, but to, for the, 
since AML is a worldwide problem, some countries are prone to risk and some are less. Why a universal requirement checklist is not prepared and applied? Uh, if Dr. Hari Kumar can answer this question, please. There are, uh, not in the form of checklist, but there are numbers of stories and uh, internal organizations listings where, from where we can infer that uh, because of these factors, particular countries and the risks, and because of these factors, particular country may not be considered in such kind of risks. If we take just take example, FATF has recently published its um, outcomes of the plenary where it has listed more than uh, 20 countries uh, considerable for money laundering from money laundering perspectives. At the same time, if we go for tax justice and uh, other measures like uh, other other institutions, we can find such kind of thing. Even if we look at the Basel Institutes, that's in, that's based in uh, Switzerland, that compiles such kind of information. So, uh, who anyone who is interested can look at that and find. Uh, which country in what kind of position is there? Though that may not be exact, but that gives you guidance. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, there are several questions. I'm very thankful to our panelists that they have responded to the question. Meanwhile, the presentations were going on. Uh, one of the query which uh, the members have, yeah, which the participants have highlighted is that will the recordings will be made available to participants? I would like to highlight that uh, all these webinars and recordings are available on the uh, AML supervision uh, section of the ICAF website. Uh, you can log into the website AML supervision page and you can find all the webinars, not uh, this one. Uh, in fact, the previous ones are also available uh, towards this. So in case of any other question, uh, we will inshallah send uh, the answers through email since we have your email addresses uh, because the time uh, is running out. So I would like to request uh, the AML, the chairman of the AML committee, Mr. Khalid Rahman, uh, for the closing remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahil. <clears throat> uh, the, it was a most uh, well-structured, well-organized uh, uh, webinar, and congratulations to you, Rahil, to start with, uh, for making that, uh, that effort. I would also, at the outside, I would also like to um, really re recognize the effort of uh, my fellow uh, committee member of uh, AML, the SAFA committee, Sajjan Kumar Kafle, who had kindly introduced to us uh, Dr. Hari Kumar Nepal. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hari, Nab uh, Hari Nip uh, <clears throat> Kumar Nepal for joining us today. Uh, I think with your, your background uh, in, in terms of the international sphere and your knowledge uh, in terms of um, supervision um, is, 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 is extremely useful. Uh, and the delivery that you gave to us was very, very insightful. Thank you very much for that. Um, I would uh, like to thank um, the President Safa uh, for his keynote um, delivery. It was um, uh, basically, it had a lot of depth and uh, based on experience in Sri Lanka, since he was also a CEO of a bank, so he could tell us exactly his experiences and how things evolved in Sri Lanka to bring to a position where they are largely compliant on the FATF uh, regulations. Uh, my deepest thanks to Watan uh, Imran. Uh, his delivery was excellent. Uh, needless to say, I mean, very, very detailed um, in the context of Pakistan also and highlighting uh, the major areas that um, accountants would have to focus on as gatekeepers. Um, and. Uh, as one of the major uh, uh, stakeholders in uh, DNFPs. Uh, so thank you very much. And also I'm grateful for your active uh, engagement with the, with the questions. And you responded to 10 questions while we were all sort of uh, hearing and thank you very much. It was, um, it was excellent, well done. Um, and last but not least, um, our, my deepest thanks to um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Shivarama Pasad, um, uh, who gave us a talk on due diligence record keeping, um, his experience in um, the Indian Central Bank um, uh, has been, uh, was very um, useful in terms of giving us a, a good um, understanding of uh, 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 what needs to be done in terms of uh, know your customer, 
and due diligence. Um, and um, uh, I uh, am thankful uh, to all the participants who were with us today. Um, we had um, a peak uh, level of participation of about 175, uh, which is very extremely good. And um, uh, we will continue to ensure that um, uh, uh, this is built on further uh, because I think that the time that we had was short. Um, we need to really have more discussions in this area. Uh, the regulations, uh, regulation number 28 uh, is extremely critical for all of us. Uh, because um, it, that, that is an area where uh, the accountants have to focus, on, uh, focus a lot and there is a lot of risk in, engaged and the risk assessment needs to be thorough and proper. Uh, with that, um, I would like to uh, bring uh, the session to close and uh, with the deepest thanks to all the panelists, uh, to the keynote speaker, uh, to the participants and we look forward to many such events in the future. So thank you very much and have a very good evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Hari Sab. And thank you, sir. Looking forward to seeing you in your uh, the results of your mutual evaluation, inshallah. Sure, sure, sure. Thank yeah, I'm going to Malaysia. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All your organization was perfect. Thank you. Bye. Bye.